Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to be here today representing Dean, uh, Dean Sten Vermont, who is actually in Sudan, uh, helping rebuild the public health infrastructure in that country. My name is Rafael Perses Camilla, and as many of you know, I'm a professor here in the Yale School of Public Health. And it is my enormous uh, pleasure and honor to introduce to you Vice Admiral Jerome Adams, who is an American anesthesiologist and as Vice Admiral in the US Public Health Service Commission Corps, who currently serves as a 20th Surgeon General of the United States. And if any of you didn't know him before, but you have been watching the television over the past three days, <laughs> I am sure you recognize uh, whom we have the pleasure of uh, hosting uh, today. Prior to becoming Surgeon General, he served as the Indiana State Health Commissioner from 2014 to 2017. And his priorities include the opioid epidemic and addiction, oral health, and the links between community health and both economic prosperity and national security. In response to the opioid epidemic, Dr. Adams issued the first Surgeon General's advisory. And I'll tell him about that. You got my mom working in the bio. <laughs> okay. I think that long so, went in. But so please, please join me in, in warmly welcoming our top nation software. so much for the opportunity to be here. And the first thing that I want to do is introduce your state health commissioner. Would you like to stand up for the folks? Uh, yeah, thank you. See, so you know who you are. And who you're <laughs> I am your commissioner, Renee Coleman Mitchell, and an alum of Yale Public Health School from many years ago. Many years ago. This, this part of the department was not here at the time. All of our lessons were across the street. So I, after, I also have to introduce our deputy commissioner for the Department of Public Health, who is also an alum. I, I wanted to make sure I did that because um, uh, when I was in Renee's role in Indiana, uh, I also had a faculty appointment at the School of Public Health. And one of the things that I think, and I also had a uh, faculty appointment at the School of Medicine, and uh, I think there's not enough connectivity between the folks who were doing the academic work and the folks who were doing the field work. And I think that you all have something to offer them, and they have something to offer you. So it's important that you know who... Who, who that is. It's also important because uh, they're the ones who are handling the coronavirus response right now. They're the ones who have programs uh, dedicated to maternal health. They're the ones who have programs dedicated to smoking. Uh, they're the ones who are actually developing the regulations, the policies that are going to be informed by the research, the work that you're doing. And she's the one that's going to give a lot of you all a job one day. So. <laughs> <laughs> but who's you all to know her? Uh, uh, one of the things I often tell folks is that uh, there are different accolades that we all have, and uh, by the time you get my age, and yes, I'm a lot older than what I look, but I shave off all the gray hair, um, you, you have your CV, and you know people can read through it, but the most important accolade attached to my name is not my MD or my MPH, uh, even though I am the uh, only Surgeon General, as far as we can tell, who's actually had formal training in public health. Um, or my uh, FASA, but it's actually the three letters DAD. I have a uh, 15, a 14, and a 10-year-old, and uh, they, they're the ones who, who uh, make sure everything that Dad says passes the smell test. And they don't care that I am the Surgeon General of the United States. I'm just a dad, particularly to my teenagers who doesn't know anything. Uh, uh, oh my gosh, uh, a medical issue. They'll take advice from their from their goofy. 13 and 14 year old friends before they'll listen to anything that I have to say to you. Uh, but, uh, but it informs everything that I do. And uh, I tell folks, I, folks call the Surgeon General the nation's doctor, but I really think of myself as the nation's patient. Uh, there is unfortunately hardly a disease you can name uh, that uh, my family hasn't been touched by. I grew up as a severe asthmatic. My mother actually uh, had a stroke in the fall. My father had a heart attack back when he was 50. Both of my grandfathers died prematurely due to smoking-related diseases. 
Uh, and and uh, again, I've got three kids at home who uh, every day I'm worried if they're going to uh, succumb to the vaping epidemic that's, that's uh, sweeping our country or the uh, availability of marijuana. And we can have a discussion about that too, if you like, because I know that's a topic of discussion here in, um, in Connecticut at the moment. But uh, I'm just honored to be here today and grateful to talk about a, a serious issue that I don't think gets nearly enough attention uh, in, this, in this country, and that's of maternal morbidity and mortality. So let's start off with maternal mortality. The fact is, uh, our rates are way too high. Maternal mortality and infant mortality are considered measures of your country's health. If you don't take care of your mothers and you don't take care of your babies, then it's a pretty good indicator that you're not taking care of anyone else out there. And for the first time in history in the U.S., women are more likely to die during childbirth than their mothers were. And one of the things, uh, again, I talk about DAD as a parent, that anyone who's a parent wants to do is to leave a better world for their children than the one that was handed to them. We can't say that we're doing that for our, for our, our babies who are growing up to be mothers right now. And despite technological advances in medical discoveries and any, and any increased access, and uh, we fight about access, but uh, we still have more access than what folks have ever had to health care, and the fact that we spend more money on hospital-based maternity care than any other country by far, there are still 700 women who die of pregnancy-related causes each year in the United States. Uh, the U.S. maternal mortality rate is around 17.4 per 100,000 live births. And uh, as you hopefully know, Connecticut's rate is 13.2, but that's compared to Massachusetts' rate of 6.1. You're double Massachusetts. New York is at about 20 Point six, and uh, New Jersey is uh, is even worse. It's important that lectures like this are held both in healthcare and in community settings. And in uh, New Jersey, I had the same conversation along with the first lady at a community health center, and that individuals and organizations from all sectors can come together and share their work and find ways to collaborate. Because health doesn't happen in hospitals, health doesn't happen in classrooms of public health. Health happens in communities. Health happens uh, in laundromats. Health happens in grocery stores, as we were talking about earlier. Health happens in daycare centers. Health happens in schools. And we need to learn in our classrooms, but we need to get out of our classrooms and into our communities. We really want to lift up health. I want to back up a little bit, actually. Um, I realized I jumped right into this. Most people don't even know what a Surgeon General is or does. Uh, first of all, uh, I am the Surgeon General and not the Attorney General. <laughs> uh, don't want the questions that the other guy is getting right now. Um, and I am neither a surgeon nor a general. I'm actually an anesthesiologist. I still practice medicine about a day a month at Walter Reed. And I had to fight to get them to allow me to do that because people freak out when the Surgeon General walks into the operating room and says, I'm going to be providing anesthesia today. Uh, but, uh, but that said, one of the things that, that often um, just really blows me away is how often decisions are made about um, health and health care at a state, a federal, and a local level without the input of anyone who's actually touched the patient. And uh, I say that to you all because one of the most powerful things you can do for your patients is advocate for them, or for the people who you're trying to serve. Uh, talk to your legislators. Go to D.C., go to the State House, show up when a bill is being debated, write an op-ed, uh, call in to a local radio show and give your input. There are things that you can do right now to help inform the broader conversation. Uh, I mentioned Surgeon General, and uh, I wear a uniform. Uh, this uniform is because uh, I am a Vice Admiral in the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps. It's one of the seven uniform services. There's Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, which most people know about. Uh, what else is there? Coast Guard. Coast Guard. Uh, and then there's two more. There's National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and then there's the Public Health Service. Uh, there's also Space Force, but they haven't been stood up yet. Uh, but, uh, but, they actually, but they actually are technically, on paper, eight uniform services now, because Space Force is a real force now, um, a real uniform service. Uh, but the Public Health Service was founded um, almost 200 years ago uh, to, uh, to inspect ships as they came into port and to uh, 
to evaluate immigrants as they came into this country to make sure they weren't bringing in infectious diseases like measles and smallpox and to make sure we were keeping our country healthy. And I never imagined that 150 years after the first Surgeon General, I would be dealing with measles yet again. But that's what happens when we uh, start to, to let public health slide. And so I want you to think about the public health service as a potential career as you move forward. We have doctors, nurses, um, pharmacists, engineers, environmental health officers, uh, physicians assistants, dietitians. We are America's health army. And we deploy whenever there is a health situation or disaster or need. I deployed to Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands after we hit three Category 5 hurricanes in a row hit our country. Uh, we have folks deployed now for the coronavirus response. We've had folks deployed for the wildfires in California. I want you to think about the Commission Corps. But uh, I want to tell you a little bit about what I'm working on as Surgeon General before we take a deeper dive into maternal health. Um, during my tenure, there are three main areas that are central to all of my efforts. Number one is addressing substance misuse. And I don't just say opioids because opioids are not the problem, they're, they're the symptom. Uh, we have an opioid epidemic. There's a person dying of an opioid overdose every 11 minutes in this country, but if we look at it as just a fire to be put out, the fire will continue to pop up in other places. Uh, we saw a prescription opioid epidemic that turned into a heroin epidemic that then turned into a fentanyl epidemic that's now turning into a meth epidemic. And the problem is we aren't dealing with the actual root causes, uh, the, the root causes of lack of attention to mental health, the root causes of a failure to address adverse childhood experiences, root causes such as an inattention to the social determinants of health and the things that create healthy and resilient communities. And so I want you to think of the broader umbrella of substance misuse. Uh, and also, there were very few people who were single, uh, single substance misusers. So again, you can tackle one at a time, but it's going to the balloon when you squeeze it's going to pop up in yet another place. But uh, I'm addressing opioids, tobacco, and e-cigarettes and marijuana during my time as Surgeon General. And uh, I'd be happy to discuss any of those areas with you during the Q&A. But I do want you to know that during the last month, I just released a uh, report of the Surgeon General, the first one on smoking cessation in 30 years. And uh, a couple of highlights from that report, 34 million Americans still smoke. 70% of them want to quit, but fewer than a third use FDA-approved quit medications and counseling. Uh, and then there are some terrible disparities embedded within our smoking rates. Uh, the LGBT, LGBTQ community smokes at much higher rates than, uh, than the national average. American Indian Alaska Natives smoke at much higher rates than the national average. Uh, people of low socioeconomic status uh, smoke at higher rates than the, na the national average. And 40% of combustible cigarettes in this country are consumed by people with a mental illness or substance use disorder diagnosis. One of the most shocking stats to me was that 40% of smokers who see a health provider don't get advised to quit. Let, 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 let me say this in no uncertain terms. Um, smoking is the number one preventable cause of early death and disease in this country from a physical risk factor point of view. The number one, 40% of people who see a health provider are not being advised to quit and, and, and having the number one cause of them dying early not be addressed. So it's critical that you all think about no matter what area of public health you're in. If you're interested in infectious disease, people with HIV now can live almost as long of a life as someone without HIV if they're put on antiretrovirals. You know what they're dying from? They're dying from smoking. Uh, it, people with diabetes uh, are, di are, are having preventable morbidity and mortality because they're still smoking no matter what their hemoglobin A1C actually is. We need to take advantage of the touch points that we have to really keep people into quitting smoking. And it's really easy. It's ask, advise, refer. Ask if you if you uh, have thought about quitting or want to quit, advise them about some of the potential benefits and refer them to the quit line. 1-800-QUIT-NOW. You don't have to be a tobacco expert to help people quit smoking. So I encourage you to go to SurgeonGeneral.gov, view that Surgeon General's report, share it, because again, there's a lot of uh, pearls in there that will really help us as we uh, tackle uh, this, this still epidemic level of smoking in our country. Uh, another 
substance used by millions across this country is marijuana. And uh, with high rates of use among youth and pregnant women and mounting evidence of its harm, last year I issued a Surgeon General's Advisory on Marijuana Use in the Developing Brain. Why? Because it's the most commonly used illicit substance in the U.S. amongst pregnant women, um, and it's uh, third for young people behind alcohol and e-cigarettes. Uh, marijuana is everywhere and in every form imaginable. It can be eaten, smoked, vaped, drunk, and uh, it can have a unique and, and, and very harmful impact on the developing brain. So pregnant women, young people, what would you do if you went outside and you saw a uh, woman breastfeeding her baby while smoking a cigar? What would you think? What would you think if you saw a woman breastfeeding her baby while she was drinking a 40 of malt liquor? So why is it that we're okay with a woman um, raising a baby, growing a baby, breastfeeding a baby, and smoking marijuana, or consuming marijuana in any shape or form? And it's important for you all to know that this ain't your mama's marijuana. Uh, the marijuana that folks think about, uh, 1995, marijuana that, that was tested was about 4.5% THC, 4.5% THC. Uh, which is the active ingredient that causes euphoria, causes you to get high, but also the ingredient that causes psycho psychologic problems, um, the ingredient that, uh, that causes impairment, um, the ingredient that, that can cause all sorts of untoward effects. 4.5%. That's like a light beer. A light beer is about 4.5% alcohol. So if I had this water bottle here filled with light beer, I can stand in front of you right now and chug it, and I wouldn't be impaired. I actually wouldn't even be legally drunk. I could go out and drive my car away if I drank this bottle filled with light beer right now. Marijuana in most dispensaries today, 25 to 30 percent THC. That's like the alcohol content of vodka. If I filled this bottle up with vodka and downed it in front of you right now, how many of you all would get in a car with me if I was going to go drive it? <laughs> that is the difference in the potency of marijuana today. Now, that's before you even consider that a third of young people who are vaping say that they're vaping marijuana. When you vape marijuana, you can get 90 plus percent THC. That's like grain alcohol. If I filled this bottle with grain alcohol and downed it here in front of you, one of you all better be calling the ambulance right now. That is the difference in potency of marijuana. And it's important that when we're having conversations about this, Regardless of how you feel about adult rights and adult use and potential medicinal benefits for ingredients, one of the hundreds of ingredients that's in marijuana, we should all not dismiss the health harms. We should all have an informed conversation about how potent these products really are. And we should all say no pregnant woman or no young person should be using these products. So. Uh, I also want to talk about one of my other priorities, and that's health and national security. Uh, and why is a certain general interested in national security? Well, 71% of our 18 to 24-year-olds in this country are currently ineligible for military service because they can't pass the fiscal, can't meet the educational requirements, and have a criminal background record. 70%. That means our nation's poor health isn't just a matter of chronic disease 20 or 30 years down the road. We are literally a less safe country because we're an unhealthy country. Still, why does a certain general care about that. Well, um, number two issue, people are going to the polls tomorrow. Number two issue that people vote on in presidential elections and in most statewide elections is safety and security. So if we want to encourage people to have a healthier society, we need to speak to them in a language that resonates, and that language that resonates is safety and security. I would much rather have the head of the army going to Congress and saying, I need more money for, uh, for, a, for a certain initiative than to have the Surgeon General of the United States. Uh, when the head of the Army goes to Congress and says, I need $50 billion for a new fighter jet, what does Congress say? They say, are you sure that's all you need? <laughs> when any of us go to Congress and say, we want $5 million for a new health initiative, what do they say? Are you sure that's what the taxpayers would want us to spend, your mo spend their money on? We need to help folks understand that if they want a safer and more secure country, we need a healthier country. The other thing I'm going to be working on is a community health and economic prosperity initiative, making the case that communities that invest in health see not just uh, uh, healthy uh, individuals, but they see 
healthy bottom lines. And uh, why am I leaning into that? Well, the number one issue people vote on, Democrat or Republican, black or white, rural or urban, is what? It's jobs and the economy. Over and over and over again. I love public health. I have a degree in public health. I will be a public health lifer. People don't vote on public health. They don't. We need to speak to people in a language that resonates, and if we want them to lift up public health, we need to stop trying to convince ourselves that we're going to convince America to make public health their number one priority. We need to start showing America that we, with our public health experience and backgrounds, can help them achieve their goals of a more prosperous and a safer and more secure country. And so I'm writing a report that is actually written uh, to talk to CEOs, to talk to economic development councils across the country, and to help them understand that when you invest in healthy policies in communities, uh, when you invest in policies like, like uh, maternal and paternal leave, and assuring a living wage, and clean air laws, and complete streets, that not only, again, are you helping out that individual in terms of them being healthier, but you're helping out your bottom line because you're going to see greater productivity. You're going to see less absenteeism. You're going to see a healthier workforce. You're going to see lower health care costs. Health care is the number two expense for most Fortune 500 companies. Number two expense. If you want to get someone on board with leaning into a healthy policy, tell them I can lower the number two expense for your company and improve your bottom line. That's what my CHEP report, Community Health and Economic Prosperity, is all about. And I encourage you all to think about ways that you can bring in partners from the business and the public safety and security communities and uh, really, uh, re really show them, when you bring them in, not to tell them that you know better than that, that they do and that they need to help you, but to think about how you can frame it in terms of this is how I can help you achieve your goals and you will gain a partner and an advocate for your causes. I learned that in Scott County, Indiana with our HIV outbreak, and uh, we can talk about that in a little bit if you want to. But uh, I, I really do want to say again, the high rate of maternal deaths and near misses in the United States is unacceptable. And the disparities by race and ethnicity are a cause for deep reflection, deep reflection and sustained action. I've been in public health a long time. Uh, when we look at disparities in public health, we start off by say, looking at black, white, black, brown, um, male, female disparities, and then we start controlling for things. Because everyone says, well, it's not really a racial issue, it's, the, it, it's poverty. And so we control for socioeconomic status, and the difference goes from here to here. And they say, well, it's not a racial issue, it's education. We control for education, and the differences go from here to here. And we keep controlling for things, and uh, actually, we usually can explain away most of the differences and disparities based on non-racial issues. That's not true for maternal mortality. A college, a black woman with a PhD is still more likely to die perinatally than a white high school dropout in this country. When you control for every known risk factor, there are still horrible racial disparities. Uh, maternal mortality is the most glaring example I've come across in my career of institutionalized bias and racism. And I think it's incumbent upon us to really look about it and talk about it as such, uh, because if we don't, then we're not really doing this issue justice. According to the CDC, about 31% of maternal deaths happen during pregnancy, about 36% happen during delivery or within a week after. And the insidious part is about 33% occur eight days to a year after birth. Why is that insidious? Because we, mom says I'm pregnant, she runs in, everyone's excited, um, you know, and then we get her enrolled in prenatal care. She got people watching her from the time she comes in with that positive pregnancy test. She goes into the hospital, people are watching her. You know what? Mom goes home after she's delivered. She may come back one time for a postnatal visit. Then see you, mom. No one's keeping an eye on mom from that point on. From that point on. And that's where still 33% of the deaths occur. From eight days after birth through the first year um, after birth. So we need to lean into that. Heart disease, stroke, and other cardiovascular conditions account for about half, half of pregnancy-related deaths. Infection, hemorrhage, and uncontrolled hypertension are also deadly and all too common. And uh, embedded within those is a discussion about postpartum depression because that impacts everything. That impacts everything, mental health issues. 
Uh, I talked about, again, the uh, disparities. Black, American, Indian, and Alaska Native women are two to six times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than white women. Maternal deaths increase sharply with increased age. We have uh, greater technology out here, and more women are foregoing childbearing until later in their lives and in their careers. And that's pr their prerogative, but we need to understand that that comes with higher risk and figure out how we can identify those folks and mitigate that risk. Uh, I talked about the, the implicit bias and racism that exists. This is very personal to me. One of my public health service officers, Lieutenant Commander Shalone Irving, a PhD prepared epidemiologist, died of complications from preeclampsia. She was well educated. She was in the public health service. She was out there protecting other people's health. And uh, she won't have the opportunity now to see her daughter grow up. Not something that you would ever expect could happen in this, in this country. Now, um, in these tragic losses, we must learn lessons and must develop a plan. Studies tell us that 60% of maternal deaths are actually preventable. 60% over half. It's this fact that drives many of us to gather in places like Connecticut and California and New Jersey and Minnesota and Mississippi. Uh, I'm delighted to say my office is working with experts across the Department of Health and Human Services and across the country to identify the actions that our federal agencies can take to reduce these rates and risk for pregnant women. Uh, I've been, again, going around the country to find out what's happening at the local level because one of the things I discovered running a health department is there's the average and then there's what's happening over here on this side of the room and then there's what's happening over here on this side of the room and then there's what's happening in the back of the room. And every single one of those statistics may be completely different, but if you only look at the average, you're not going to see the differences. Uh, you travel to different parts of the state. Some are rural, some are urban. Sometimes you travel to different parts of the same city. Sometimes you cross the street and those differences can occur. So it's, again, important that we are embedded into the community. Uh, but I want you to know is my personal contribution as Surgeon General, my office is working on a call to action on maternal health that will be released later this year, uh, a publication that will convey the evidence as we know it and deliver a charge to all that we have a role to play. I can't fix um, bias and racism in three or four months. But there is some low-hanging fruit that we can go after and bring people's attention to uh, and really say, are you leaning into this? And we talked about some of these issues earlier. We can have hospital system screen for postpartum depression. We can have better diagnosis and treatment and attention to hypertension in moms. We can better risk stratify people. We can make sure we have more appropriate follow-ups for longer times after people leave the hospitals. And while we're doing all that, we also need to be digging into the implicit bias and racism that makes all these factors worse. But we're still learning from experts across the country. And again, I want to thank both of you for great presentations earlier on breastfeeding and on maternal mental health, both of which impact both mom and baby. So um, I want to shut it down now because uh, my aide in the back of the room is giving me the, uh, the, 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 it's time to stop Dr. Adams. You all can hopefully uh, tell that I'm passionate about this issue, but I want to leave you all with a couple of calls to action. Uh, number one, stress the importance of maternal mortality review committees and make sure the one in Connecticut is both active and really leaning into health equity. So maternal mortality review committees are run by the state. Um, and now all 50 states have a maternal mortality review committee. But uh, if you've seen one, you've seen one. We want to make sure the committee in Connecticut is looking at all deaths, is really digging into them, is looking at different risk factors, is looking again at the front of the room, the back of the room, the side of the room, and underneath the room to figure out all the different reasons that moms are dying uh, during the perinatal period. Uh, Connecticut established, uh, again, a, a maternal review committee, but not all U.S. states gather information on race, ethnicity, and income because there are no national requirements for data collection and reporting. Having these data are critical to recognize disparities. And review all maternal deaths. You know, this is going to sound weird, but here's the biggest challenge with addressing maternal mortality, and it's the same challenge many of you all will face in your careers. I told you 700 women die, and some of you were shocked by that. Some of you, quite frankly, said, only 700 women die? 
And you may have said that or thought that because there are plenty of other things that we, we can name 10 things easily that more than 700 people die of every year. Car accidents, guns, opioid overdoses, cardiovascular disease, diabetes. It's easy to name a number of things that more people die from every year. But for every mom that dies, 70 more have ca uh, nearly catastrophic misses, have preventable morbidity. It's important that we're not just addressing maternal mortality, we're addressing morbidity. And that, uh, and that folks know that this has a ripple effect across communities that's more than the loss of one life, as important as the loss of one life is. Secondly, make sure you address biases. Health equity has to be embedded into everything that you do. I don't care what you do for the rest of your career in public health because it does no good to make the averages better for the affluent white people in the suburbs and to ignore the low socioeconomic status people, the brown people, the black people, the LGBTQ community, the folks who are often uh, not thought about and are, and are in the shadows. Very important that we address biases across. I mean, and we have a lot of, uh, again, LGBTQ community uh, folks who are out there now um, raising kids and having babies. What are we doing to make sure uh, they feel included in our maternal morbidity and mortality efforts? Thirdly, communicate. And while that, for many of us, immediately invokes talking to other people, Part of communication, the most important part, is actually listening. It's actually listening. So engage families. Increase knowledge around prenatal visits, healthy behaviors, and early warning signs. But really, you have to think of, of, of what I often uh, say um, to folks. Um, communities want nothing about us without us. They want to be involved. Uh, I actually, you know, I, I didn't grow up with a whole lot of money. As a matter of fact, I, I tell people I'm middle class, and my parents and all my friends say, no, you were poor. <laughs> you were poor. But that said, um, I had a mother and a father who loved me. I never felt like I wanted for food out there. It is easy even for me to think that I know what the problem is a person is having and to want to talk to them about the importance of breastfeeding while ignoring the fact that they've got, they've got domestic violence issues at home, while ignoring the fact that they're sleeping in a car. They ain't worried about breastfeeding, you know, when, when, they're, when they're trying to deal with these social determinants of health, these other stressors in their lives. So really talk to these communities and show them that you care so that they care what you know. Once you ask them what they care about you can engage, and, and, and legitimately try to address it, then you can engage them. And once you deal with these issues that they see are their priorities, then they'll be willing to listen to you when you want to talk to them about your priorities. Provide tools that help women have safe and respectful births and make sure the materials are at an appropriate health literacy level and easily accessible. What do I mean by easily accessible? We're dealing with this with coronavirus right now. Um, we are terrible health communicators. Absolutely terrible and that's why we're getting our asses kicked online. When you talk about vaccinations, when you talk about coronavirus, when you talk about um, vaping out there, we aren't where the target audience actually is. We need to be better on social media. We need to be better about framing our messages. We need to be on TikTok. <laughs> we, we, we really do. Um, the kids who are out there who we're trying to target for vaping, they don't go, huh, let me see what the Surgeon General says about this on SurgeonGeneral.com. <laughs> That's not what they do. We need to figure out how we can be better communicators. And to the faculty in this room, I implore you to think about, for all your classes, how you incorporate better education and communication. Yale, I'm sure, it's a, it's a big school. It's a nice school. There's got to be a school of communication here. It, right? <laughs> no, well, there's got to be one of them somewhere. Uh, how, can we bring, how can we bring in those communicators? How can we bring in the media? Just simply asking them, how do you see a story? How do you talk about a story? Bringing in people from the, the Hartfield Journal. Um, how, do we, how do we become better communicators? Because all the scientific evidence in the world means nothing if you're not translating it into behavior change at the actual ground level. And then finally, focus on improving overall health. I've talked about clinical health a lot. Um, probably more than what I should have because I'm a doctor, but one of the most important things 
to remember is that only about 10% of your overall health is determined by your access to health care. Yet we spend 90 plus percent of our time, our talent, and our treasure focused on 10% of the problem. And we wonder why we're not bending the, the health care cost curve. Now, I know this is a school of public health, and you all know this more than others, but U.S. spends far more on health care than any other country, by far. It ain't even close. And has terrible outcomes terrible outcomes, and below 20 in terms of, uh, in terms of life expectancy, um, below 20 in terms of infant mortality, below 20 in terms of uh, maternal mortality. But if you actually in include a more, broader, a more broad and more expansive definition of health, we actually spend about the same amount of money on health as countries like the UK, Switzerland, Canada. It's just that instead of them sinking it all into downstream safety net care, they spend most of their money on expansive policies that support people and prevent them from getting sick in the first place. So think about how you can improve overall health. Uh, yes, we want to make sure that mom, when she shows up in the hospital, is getting top-notch care, but we want to make sure she's healthy before she ever shows up in the hospital because that's going to be the biggest predictor of whether or not she has a healthy pregnancy and a healthy baby. If you don't have a healthy mom, then chances are, you, or chances are much greater that you're going to have an unhealthy pregnancy, you're going to have complications, you're going to have problems down the road. But if we're doing everything right beforehand, and when I say beforehand, I'm not just talking about even during pregnancy. I'm talking about before they even make, make uh, decisions about becoming pregnant, before they even become pregnant, then we're going to have a healthier mom and a healthier baby. So last that we could talk about, um, before I open up questions on maternal mortality, I do want to talk about coronavirus for, for just a minute or two. Uh, important to know, that uh, we had an aggressive containment policy initially in the United States, uh, meaning that uh, uh, we identified the places where uh, there was the biggest impact and, uh, and limited travel back and forth to those places. And what did that do? Well, it was successful in slowing the spread of coronavirus to the United States. It gave us time to prepare. But containment only works if you have a limited uh, source. We now have coronavirus cases in over 40 countries. We can't hermetically seal the United States. So we are going to see more cases of coronavirus here in this country. But the important thing to remember is we've been here before. H1N1, MERS, SARS. We know the playbook. We know what to do. We just need to implement the playbook and not panic, not freak out. One of the things you all, uh, I think can, think, can help me with as health educators and health communicators is communicating risk. People had no clue how to gauge risk. And that's not just in the health field, that's across the board. There's study after study after study that shows human beings are terrible at evaluating risk. There have been more people who died in Connecticut this year from the flu than will likely be diagnosed uh, in 2020 with coronavirus. There have been 18,000 people who have died from the flu in the United States this year. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball, and you never want to make projections, knock on uh, Formica, but uh, <laughs> I would be shocked. I would be shocked if we even came to a fraction of that in terms of coronavirus deaths. 18,000 flu deaths. Uh, China, we're already seeing case, uh, reports of cases going down in China. We need to make sure we are communicating to the public uh, that, uh, that, yes, you should be concerned, you should be cautious, you should be prepared, but that does not mean that you should panic, because panic will kill more people than coronavirus will if we let people, uh, again, just run wild with, with thoughts that, uh, that, that, again, lead to stigma, that lead to discrimination, that lead to hoarding, that lead to other downstream complications that we often see happen when folks are scared, particularly of infectious disease outbreaks. What does the public need to know? They need to know that state and local and federal institutions are preparing, um, particularly as we shift from a containment phase to a mitigation phase. Preparing plans to possibly cancel large public gatherings, preparing plans to possibly telework, preparing plans to do things that are in the, the pandemic playbook. Again, we know this stuff. We know this stuff. And there are things that individuals can do. Individuals should clean their hands, wash their hands frequently. They should cover their cough. Um, they, should, uh, they should clean surfaces. 
and uh, they should practice social distancing. And you'll see that for a lot of folks, I've been doing an elbow bump instead of doing a handshake. There are simple things that, that, that folks can do, and why is it important to share that with them? Number one, because it's going to protect them from coronavirus. Number two, because it's going to protect, protect them from the flu, which they are more likely to, be, to get and to be hospitalized from. Number three, because an important part of psychology and communication is giving people some sense of control. So you've got to give them something that they actually can do. What are they doing now? They're going out and buying masks. And anyone who follows me on Twitter will see that uh, I put out a tweet this weekend that went viral. I mean, it's the first truly viral tweet that I've had. Uh, uh, well, over 50,000 hits. I've gained, over, uh, I've gained about 20,000 new Twitter followers in, in less than 48 hours off of that tweet where I told people to stop buying masks. Uh, but, again, people are scared. And they're trying to ask, what can we do to respond? And I'm... I know this isn't necessarily a medical crowd, so I better explain. Masks um, have not been shown in any study to decrease the transmission of a respiratory disease when the general public utilizes them. Surgical masks are sieves for respiratory droplets. They hang loosely on your face. They're not going to do anything. N95 masks, those of us who work in healthcare facilities, we have to get fit tested to wear them properly. They're very uncomfortable. And most lay people who put on an N95 mask actually spend most of their time touching their face, adjusting their mask, and they're actually increasing their risk of taking something from a surface and putting it on their mucosal membrane. They, they, you know, they, they are increasing their risk of getting a disease by wearing that mask. And when they take those masks and hoard them, then they aren't available for the healthcare professionals who actually do need them. So spread the word, stop buying masks unless you've been instructed to by a health provider. Uh, one more important caveat, Masks do help prevent you from spreading flu or, or coronavirus to other people if you are sick. So if you have a viral load and you're coughing and sneezing, it's going into the mask and not going out into the public. But that's not why people are buying masks. They aren't buying them saying, oh, I don't want to get anyone else sick. Let me wear this mask. <laughs> They're buying them because they mistakenly believe it's going to protect them. We need to tell them that's not going to protect you, but here's something that will. Clean, cover, and contain. So... That's my, that's my spiel. Uh, I, I'm happy to take a few questions from you all, but most of all, I want to say thank you for your commitment, for your dedication to public health, because we need good people. Uh, I'm passionate about this, but I'm one person. The impact that all of the people in this room can have is greater than the Surgeon General of the United States. As many Twitter followers as I have, I guarantee you if we added up all the Twitter followers of the people in this room, you all would collectively have a greater social media impact and a greater community impact than I have. So please understand that power that you have. Please wield it responsibly, but please don't be afraid to utilize that connection and that power that you all have to lift up the public's health. It's too important for us not to be weighing in on these important conversations. Thank you. Well, you, you had your hand up first. Yes, hi. Thank you very much for your talk. My name is Sasha James Contarelli. I'm one of the faculty members at YSN School of Midwifery, and nursing school and mm -hmm. midwifery program. Yes. And, uh, but I'm a New Yorker and from the city, and I'm sure you're aware of the statistics in New York related to maternal mortality. I'm interested to hear your thoughts and perspective on midwifery in the role of combating maternal mortality in the United States. So... Dr. Uh, Dennis Anderson Villalus is a dietitian. He's my aide right now, but my aide before, before Dennis was a midwife. Um, I am a big proponent of trying to figure out how we can utilize more, a wider array, array of health providers. I think um, some of the advantages of midwives, number one, they know how to deliver a baby. And I'm going to get killed by my healthcare colleagues out there, but... Um, a lot of our OBGYNs are graduating and they don't know how to deliver a baby the traditional way. Uh, they know that when you see D cells, we got to go to C section. We got to cut. And uh, there are all sorts of reasons for that educational reasons, legal reasons. But we're graduating, um, again, OBGYNs who really don't know how to do a difficult vaginal um, delivery. And so midwives can help with that. And I've been to institutions, I've been to NYU, I've been out in San Diego. Um, where they have midwives embedded with the OBGYNs, and it really is a great care model. It's a great care model. The other thing that midwives do is expand access, um, and, uh, and it's, it's a 
quite frankly, in many cases, a more approachable person, uh, particularly for women uh, from communities of color, than the traditional stuffy doctor. And so I think there's lots of opportunity there to really leverage midwives, to leverage pharmacists, to leverage nurse practitioners, to leverage an array of providers to increase access to care, also to increase quality of care, and to um, kind of lower that separation level between the provider and the patient. That's my thoughts on the delivery. Thank you. Gentleman in the back. Yes. How are you, sir? Good. I love your hair. How do you do it? I've been working on mine like that for a while. I don't know. What kind of shampoo do you use? Sure. <laughs> Look at him, now he's playing coy. I'm not going to tell you my secret to my beautiful locks. <laughs> uh, my name is Augie Lamarck. I'm a resident physician in the primary care and the HIV program here. Um, my question kind of gets a little bit at what you're talking about, like postpartum kind of being a high rate for maternal mortality. Um, and a little bit about uh, the data that we came out after the Affordable Care Act showing that states that expanded Medicaid had lower rates of maternal mortality. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, as you're probably aware, the current budget coming out of the administration is going to cut Medicare by a trillion dollars over a decade. And so my question for you is, in the report on maternal mortality, will you commit to recommending uh, expanding and supporting Medicare? And Medicaid. Me, me, Medicare, so, Medicaid, okay. Medicaid. So, no, no exactly. And then, and then, in addition to that, will you commit to um, supporting Medicaid in that report? And if not, will you amplify and share on your Twitter handle uh, the studies that show that Medicaid has decreased maternal mortality? So, um, thank you for that question. Very important question. Um, I, I don't want to pander to you all, but I think it's first important for folks to understand the difference between Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, Medicare uh, takes care of uh, the elderly, they also, also can take care of uh, disabled folks. And uh, Medicaid takes care, traditionally um, has been thought of as taking care of folks of a lower socioeconomic status. There are also some other uh, situations where folks can, can, can um, get on Medicaid. Here's the important point for this conversation. Medicaid covers um, about 50% of the births in this country. In some states, it's a much higher percentage than that. That's number one. Um, number two, uh, what I believe as Surgeon General of the United States is that access to high quality, affordable uh, health care is critically important for folks. I really 100% do believe that. We live in a, uh, in a country where these states have an incredible uh, amount of, uh, of autonomy. It's a federation. Um, that's not the way I designed it. That's, that's the country we live in. And um, what this administration is, is committed to doing is giving states the flexibility to, uh, to, to really lean into what they want to do with their Medicaid program. So uh, I, I want to say to you all that I think what the important role for us to do is to be in a situation like your health commissioner, uh, to, to go to the legislature, the state legislature, to, to testify to help your state legislatures understand the importance of having uh, Medicaid policies, most of which are determined at the state level, that actually pay for the things, reimburse for the things that we know will actually improve health outcomes. So uh, what's an example of that? Uh, this administration has approved a record number of Medicaid 1115 waivers, which um, a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of the CMS rules come from Congress and say, thou shalt not pay for X, Y, or Z. So you can apply to the state for a waiver that allows you to pay for these things. So uh, uh, North Carolina got the largest Medicaid waiver, uh, I think, in ever to, uh, to pay for the social determinants of health through their state Medicaid program. Other states have applied to address transportation or housing uh, for substance misuse. Uh, I am out there as a public health advocate saying, here's the data that says that coverage matters. Uh, please don't mistake a, and get caught up in a political argument that obscures the, 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 the root argument. Coverage is what matters the most. Um, the ACA is a vehicle to coverage. Medicaid, um, in different forms of Medicaid, if you've seen one Medicaid program, you've seen one, one Medicaid program, is a vehicle to coverage. 
Indiana. We actually instituted the Healthy Indiana Plan where we had a health savings account and people have to contribute to it. Um, we were one of the red states that actually um, expanded access to coverage through the ACA. And we were able to do that and get it approved because we sat down with our state and incorporated, quite frankly, some elements of personal responsibility that were what was necessary for us to get that, that Medicaid expansion over the finish line. So I'm a pragmatist. And I'm, talking, I'm actually going deeper into this because I want you all to really understand what I'm thinking and what we have to deal with at a, uh, at a broader level. Um, there are things that I would like to do. If I had my magic wand, there are things that I would do. But we live in a democracy. How many of you all believe in democracy? Oh, what? That, that's it? How many of you all believe in democracy? Because the fact is, most people say they believe in democracy. But the fact is, they only believe in democracy, really, when it delivers the results that they want. Um, we are doing what, as an administration, what the elected officials right now in this country feel like they were given a mandate to do when they were elected. It's not my job as Surgeon General to change the results of the election. It's not my job as Surgeon General to weigh in on political matters. It's my job to make sure people understand the science. Coverage does matter. Coverage matters, and we all need to make sure we can show folks how coverage matters, and then that will inform the broader debate about how people achieve that coverage. And that's as honest with you all as I can be. Again, uh, I, I take pains, and perhaps you all see that, to try to avoid being partisan, because it only hurts you in the long run. But I will never run away from the science. And the science says coverage is what matters. And uh, again, when I approach it that way, and that's the way we approached it in Indiana, we were able to get expansion in a red state. We were able to get syringe service programs legalized in a red state uh, that previously didn't have syringe service programs. I stand before you as living proof that when you approach uh, difficult and controversial situations from an apolitical lens, you actually can move the ball perhaps further down the field than what you would have ever imagined in a different scenario. And I know we've got to get ready to go, but I, I want to finish by talking about the HIV outbreak in, uh, in Indiana because um, there are some folks here at Yale who don't think I did such a good job of it. Uh, the fact is, if you go to New York City, anyone from New York City? New York City has more syringe service programs than anywhere in the country. If you ask the average person from New York City, they couldn't tell you where the nearest syringe service program was in their, in their city. You go to Scott County, Indiana, everyone in that county Everyone in that county can tell you where the syringe service program is. They can tell you when they pass by it back and forth going to school, or when they pass by it going to work, or when they pass by it going to church. Um, health is local, and we need to understand that we have to have local buy-in when we are promoting controversial health interventions. Uh, I had the authority as state health commissioner to go to Scott County and say, we're going to open up a syringe service program, and I'm going to start passing out needles. You know what would have happened if I'd done that? The local sheriff would have set up a roadblock outside the syringe service program because the local sheriff has that authority. And the local sheriff um, would have arrested the first couple of people who came in to get syringes. And the syringe service program would have been an abject failure, and people would still be having HIV, having HIV spread in that community. I went to that community. Remember I said nothing about us without us. I sat down with the local sheriff. Don't tell anyone this. I had a beer with him. And I, uh, I said, what are your concerns? And the local sheriff said, well, my concerns are the revolving door at my prison and that my officers are going to get stuck by needles. And I said, well, look, if we do this together, together, if we do this right, um, then uh, we will refer people to care. And we've had over 1,700 people referred to treatment through our syringe service program in Scott County. I said, if we do this right, um, the studies show that you'll lower needle stick injuries to law enforcement officers by 60%. Uh, and by working with those local partners, they became supporters of what I believed in. And I didn't get a whole loaf. I didn't get everything I would have liked, but I got a half a loaf, which is more than what most other places would have gotten. And because we were able to do that in a conservative state, Kentucky went from zero to almost 80 syringe service programs in their state. The rest of the country said, well, by golly, if, 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 uh, if Vice President Pence can do that in Indiana, we can do that here. I truly, in my heart, believe that we did more for harm reduction across the nation 
with what we did in Indiana than what you could have ever done in a blue state for harm reduction across the nation. And that's simply because of the environment that we were in and the precedent that was set by doing it in that state. So that's, that's all to clo close by saying that um, we need to make sure we are always promoting the science, that we're not getting sucked into promoting political agendas. And uh, we need to understand that when we sit down with communities and show them that we care, they will start to care what we know and that we will be able to actually improve the health of communities because we gain people's trust as objective purveyors of the facts and of the science. And that's true whether you're talking about HIV or maternal mortality and morbidity or uh, opioids or any other health condition we have out there. So thank you to all of you for the opportunity to be here today. And I really thank you for that question because it gave me an opportunity to talk about an issue that I love to talk about. This is what we talk about when I told you I had a faculty appointment at the School of Public Health. We talk about practical public policy. Practical public policy. And I'm going to close with one more audience participation because I know folks get up, can get upset when they think that we are compromising our, our scientific health ideals. Uh, I guarantee you, I guarantee you that in this room full of public health advocates, you all don't even prioritize health in your day-to-day -day lives above other priorities. And I'll prove it to you. I'll prove it to you because this is a good thing to close on. Um, raise your hand for me if sometime in the last, and you all got to be honest with me here, <laughs> if sometime in the last, let's just say, say two weeks, for the sake of your school, which, or your job, your school or your job, in school we're doing it so we can get a job, you skip the meal, ate an unhealthy meal, skipped a workout, skipped time with your family. Nobody's raising their hands? None of you all done that? Don't, don't you all know that's unhealthy? Don't you know that? But in your day-to-day -day lives, every day you make decisions that prioritize other things in your life over doing what you know to be healthy. And in many cases, you do it for economic advantage, either now or down the road. You do it for safety and security. You do it for those other things in Maslow's hierarchy that we know from psychology are more important motivators to us than this idea of health, which is really the lowest on Maslow's hierarchy, self-actualization. You know, someday when all this other stuff is taken care of, when I've met my needs, when I'm safe and secure, when I've found love, I'll get around to being the best me that I can be. But it's important that you all understand that because it's easy to sit back and judge individuals and to judge other policymakers um, for not following the science. It's really hard to admit that we don't even follow the science in our day-to-day -day lives. But the important point is to remember that our job is not to seek a world where the science is 100% what leads us all the time. Our job is to make sure we have trusted relationships with people and that we inject as much of the science into difficult policy discussions as possible, and that when people trust us, they will continue to come to us when they do want scientific and health information. So thanks again, and uh, you all have a wonderful evening. It was great being here with you all at Yale, and I know you will probably never invite me back after that last, uh, <laughs> last bit, but, uh, but uh, I, I really hope that, that you all think about these issues, and particularly as it relates to maternal health, because we will not solve the implicit bias, the institutionalized racism, the lack of trust that communities have with us if we don't think about how we can be more compassionate and forge those relationships. It doesn't matter if you're black, white, rich, poor, Democrat, Republican, uh, we need to figure out how we can make those links so that we can bring the science to the, to the forefront. Thank you. Thank you.